Hello again, this is David Black, and welcome back to another browser-based software training video. Today we're going to be learning the second part of MIT Scratch. Now remember, last time we learned how to do linear programming, that is, to bring two characters, or sprites, in on the stage, and then have them interact by carrying on a conversation. Now this is designed just to play forward from the beginning to the end. But now it's time to learn how to program in interactivity. That is, where the user can click on buttons or use keyboard commands to control the sprites and have it do different responses. Scratch is fairly easy to use because it uses a modular, brick-based programming environment. Now we'll learn how to do this step by step. But today we're going to be looking at how to use random number generators, how to do button rollover effects, if-then statements, loops, variables, and other types of commands that are really good for doing game programming. In fact, that's what we're learning, how to make games. Remember that you can always find a game similar to the one you want to create and then reverse engineer it. All you have to do is look at the code and emulate it. Let's get started. Now it's time to get interactivity into your projects by allowing the user to click buttons or keyboard keys to cause the sprites to respond. Let's look at a quiz that I've already created for chemistry students to help them learn lab safety rules and equipment. I've loaded it up here in Scratch along with the code blocks and sprite window. I designed this interface in Adobe Photoshop, but you could do it just as easily in Photopea. I started larger, then made it the right size to fit the Scratch stage, which is 480 pixels wide by 360 pixels tall, with 0, 0 being in the center of the stage. In this game, as you can see, I have five buttons, one each for the multiple choice answers of A, B, C, and D, plus a Next button to choose another question. The entire background image was imported as the backdrop, and the button images were loaded with the up state as the new sprite, and then with the over and down states as different costumes. Here are the code bricks for doing the rollover effects. On the green flag, I want to show the sprite just in case it is hidden, and then make sure it's showing the up costume. Since you cannot know when the user will be rolling over a button, all of the effects must be inside of an infinite forever loop. Scratch has the ability to test what the mouse is doing, and if it's inside of a sprite each time it goes through the loop. You have to look for the event using an if-then statement. If the condition is true, then it changes the costume of the sprite to the over state. If the mouse is inside the sprite, and it is pressed down, or if both conditions are true, then it will switch the costume to the down state. In order to make this work, you have to construct the bricks to test for two states at the same time, and that's using an AND command. Both this and that must be true. Once you have one button working, then it's really easy to just copy and paste the entire handler onto a new button and then merely switch out the costume names. With the button rollover effects working, you can then go on to actually program the buttons to do something, that is, make a sprite respond or change something that happens on the stage. Now you're probably asking, wait a second, he's showing us how to make a quiz. I thought he said we're going to be doing games. Well, really, a quiz is a type of game, but this is kind of an easier way to learn how to do it. Just think of how you could take these same structures, random number generators, if-then statements, loops, variables, and so on, and then use them for creating a game. You can add to it things like keyboard commands, or if a sprite is touching a color, something could happen. So there's a lot of possible interactivity you can do. Now, since this lab safety program is based on a random number generator, where it picks a random number from 1 to 50, I actually had to create 50 different question sprites, or costumes, and 50 different lab equipment costumes, not to mention 15 costumes for the buttons and the background image. So that's a lot of costumes and images to create. Obviously, it takes careful planning. I would really recommend that you sketch everything out in advance when you're trying to make a game or quiz, know exactly what it's going to look like, and then actually make a list of all of the assets that you're going to need, all of the sprites and all of their costumes and everything, so that you can just check them off as you create them. The worst thing in the world is to get in the middle of a game programming and realize that you're missing a piece and then have to go back and recreate it. 
Now to see how I planned out this quiz project, let's actually create another project from the beginning that's a little bit simpler. What we're going to do is to make a quiz on different types of rocks for an earth science class. We'll make this easier though. So there'll just be 10 questions, 10 different types of rocks. We'll have to create a background image for it and all the buttons to make this work, but it's going to be fairly similar to what you just saw with the lab safety quiz. But I'm gonna show you how to do this from the very beginning. I'll take this step by step so that you can see how to create the different images in Photoshop or Photopea and then how to load them into Scratch and program them. So here I have the interface that I designed for this quiz on the rock cycle. I used a photograph that I took of Capitol Reef National Park last summer and I did this all at the original high resolution of the image. It happens to have the same dimensions as the final picture that I need to create for Scratch. Now what I did is I selected areas of the image and then copied and pasted them into upper layers. You can see that here as I scroll through it. So for example, I selected an area and uh, that's going to be for doing the questions. That's over on the right hand side. And then I used a layer mask to kind of cut that off. And then I also put a drop shadow and a bevel and emboss on it and lightened it up a little bit to make it stand out from the background. I've got some text in here, for example, the text for the score. I created text for the buttons. So here's the different states of the button. Right now I've got the basic button text. So this is for, let me give this a different name. This is going to be the up state of the button. And it's got some layer effects on it here. Drop shadow, bevel and emboss, and the original kind of light blue color that I selected from the small patch of sky up there in the upper right hand corner. Now if I turn this off, the button itself doesn't change but the text does. Here's the rollover effect. So I changed the basic color of the button, I turned off the drop shadow, and I added an outer glow, the yellow glow you see around it. Now if I turn that off, here's the down state of the button. I changed the basic uh, bevel and emboss to a pillow emboss, so it looks like it's pressed down, and then change the hue to a dark blue color. So now what I'm going to do is to split out those pieces. So now I've got down, over, and up sitting on top of each other. And now I can start separating them out from each other. So let's start with the A button here. I've got it selected. I have to pay attention to what level that I'm on. So I'm on the down layer and I'll do Command C to copy it, Command N to make a new file, hit enter because it will be the right size. Command V to paste. It's got the whole button in it since I've merged them. Got to flatten it. That's Command E. Okay. So then Shift Command S to save as. I'll save it as a PNG and I'll call this A button D for down. Okay. That's one of them. But I still have my original file. I can close the file that I just made. I'll go back to this one. All right, and let's do the same thing since it's selected, but now I'll change, I'll turn off the eyeball on the down and select the over, and let's do the same thing. So Command C to copy, Command N to make a new file, enter, Command V to paste, Command E to flatten, and Shift Command S to save, and this is going to be A button O for over and save. Great, I can close that, go back to this file. Now uh, let's choose the up version of it. Make sure I'm on that layer and that it's turned on. Okay, and I've still got the same exact area selected. So Command C, Command N to make a new file, enter, Command V to paste, Command E to flatten, Shift Command S to save as, and we'll call this A button up or U. Now I'll go ahead and do the same thing for the other four buttons. So that includes B, C, and D, and then the next button. And I've already saved out the pieces from um, the text area and for the image area. And then I'll just have to save the background file and we'll be ready to roll inside Scratch. 
Now that I've finished creating all of the pieces that I'll need inside of Scratch, it's time to actually build the game itself. So I'm in Scratch and I'm going to go ahead and choose Create. It's going to build a new project. Now I do not want the Scratch Cat, so I'll click on the little trash can and goodbye Scratch Cat. But it's time to bring in the pieces. So first let's bring in the backdrop. So choosing a backdrop, I'll upload the backdrop here. This is over on the far right bottom side. Okay, so where is this? I'll go find that. I'll be right back. Okay, here are all the pieces. What I want to bring in is the backdrop. Here it is, Rock Cycle Backdrop. Now I've designed this so it should fit perfectly onto the stage. Let's go ahead and go in and look at this. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. Now, of course, it's at 72 pixels per inch, and so the images aren't that great, but since I started with a high-quality image and then scaled it down, it still looks pretty good. Okay, now let's bring in the other pieces, which are all going to be sprites. So I'll go to the little scratch cat icon here. Now, if I just choose it without doing anything, it comes into the pre-designed or, or library here. I'll go ahead and go back. And what I want, though, is to choose the Upload Sprite thing here. And I've got a bunch of sprites to bring in. Now, I have to kind of think here because I need to bring in the original up version of each sprite if it's a button, but then load in the other versions as costumes on this sprite. So I'll choose the A button, Up State, the B button, Up State, the C button, Up State, D button, Up State, Next button, Up State, then I've got all these different questions. So I'm going to just bring in question number one here. And then I've got the rocks at another spot that I'll have to go get in a moment. But I think this is everything I need for now. Oh, the image box blank I will need. And the question box blank. That should do it. And it's loading them all in and putting them in wherever it feels like putting them. So I'm going to have to go in and line them up really carefully. That should be everything for now. So I am bringing in now the costumes for the different sprites. I've already got the blank image box, but the various rocks are going to go on top of that or switch into it as costumes. So here they are. They're inside my rock cycle folder. And one at a time, they're bringing it. You'll notice that I made these by bringing in the same rock pictures that I used in the photo P video. I put them on top of the image box itself so they'll look like they completely belong here. Okay, and you can choose any one of them. Altogether there are 11 costumes, including the original picture. Now let's do the same thing for the A button. I will come in and load costumes for it. I'll have to go out to a different part where these are located. And the next button, over and down. Okay, I brought in the rocks already, but now I need to bring in the questions. And they're all as costumes of the blank question box. Now I should probably make another thing here that is basically um, the zero question or the instructions in other words, but I'll do that in a minute. Okay, I've got everything in here that I need, so it's time to start programming this. There are two different what we call handlers here. In other words, two programs that are running simultaneously. The one on the left basically does the rollover effects. As you recall, just a moment ago, we loaded in all the different costumes for the buttons, for the questions, for the rocks, and so on. For each button, there are three images. The up image, when the mouse is not over the top of the button. The over image, when the mouse is pointing or touching to the button. And then finally, the down, when both the mouse is on the button and the mouse is being pressed down. So if you look at the left handler, when the green flag is clicked, it makes sure that the A button is showing the up version. 
and then it goes into a forever loop because you never know exactly when the user is going to be actually moving the mouse over the top of the button. So it has to be looking for this event at all times. During the loop, if touching mouse pointer, it's kind of a backwards way of saying it. In other words, if the mouse pointer is touching this object, we're on the A button, that's what we're programming. So if the mouse pointer is touching this object, then I switch to the over version of it. Else, it just goes back to the up version. So as soon as it's not touching anymore, if I go back outside of it, the else command tells it to bring it back to the up state. But then there's a second handler that has a Boolean command. Inside that kind of hexagon shape that's in the if then statement, I put a green operator that says and on it. And it's looking for both things. Both conditions have to be true for this if then statement to activate. The mouse has to be down and the mouse pointer has to be touching it. Now if I come over here and click the green flag, it goes back to the start here where I put some instructions in now. Then if I roll over the A button, it switches to the up version. If I press down my mouse, it switches to the down version. And when I release the mouse, it's still inside of the button, and so it's showing the over version. And now I roll out and it's showing the up version. The purpose of this next button is to choose the next question. But to be able to control that, I'm going to have to put together a series of variables. So let me show you how to do that. A variable is basically a container or a box in which you put information and the computer program can keep track of that information for you. And it can happen either in front of the scenes if you want to, the variable can actually show up on the page, or it can happen entirely behind the scenes where the user never sees it, but it's still keeping track of information. And as you notice, there is an operator category here called variables. And there's lots of things variables can do, but the first thing you have to do is to make them. So I'll make a variable. What do I want to call it? I'm going to call it QNUM because I like that name. Okay, for all sprites, yes, I want to be able to use this for a lot of different sprites. So here it is. Now, right now it's, um, it's available everywhere, but I'm going to put this basically on the question sprite when I start using it. So there's QNUM. All right, so I need to do like answer num. I'll just say ants num because the ants are numb. They do not have any feeling. Okay, so I have ants num, I have QNUM. What else do I need? I'm going to need to have a score. So call this score for lack of a better term. Keep your variable names simple so that you don't have to keep using them and they always have to be one word. So if you want to be able to combine two words together, abbreviate them, you can put underscores if you need to, or just use capital letters for the next word. Okay, and I still will need one more, which is going to be counts or how many times it's counted. I don't know if you notice, but the variables are showing up on the stage. Okay, so I've got four variables going on. Some of them I'm not going to really worry about, but I'm going to keep them on the stage. Now, if I undo the check mark here in front of them over here on the left side, they will disappear. Let's see what happens. So here's QNUM is gone. Score I do want to show up. And you can also change what this looks like. There's, there's different types of, uh, you know, views you can look. Um, but as you notice, the variable goes inside of other codes, especially these operators up here that have the round circles. So that's where we'll start using them. But for now, I'm going to keep them on the stage, uh, but let's put them a little bit out of the way. And eventually we'll turn these off. But the score, I'll put here, it's too big for the box. If I hold my mouse down on it, I can choose normal readout, large readout, slider. If I choose large readout, all it does is show the answer and doesn't give the name, which is what I want in this case. The rest of these will just be hidden eventually. Now that I have all of the variables created, the next thing that I need to do is to make sure at the beginning of the program, when the green flag is clicked, that all of them are set to zero. So I've gone ahead and dragged in this block, um, set answer num to zero. 
I'll go ahead and, and do this with some others. Also want to make sure not just answer num, but counts is set to zero. I have four variables. Let's do each one. Um, QNum set to zero. Every time that I click on this next button, and I am programming in the next button, in this case it doesn't really matter where, but the next button makes sense as sort of the central button for everything, since that's where we're beginning. At the same time though, I want to make sure that when I click on this, it's going to set um, the QNum to a random number. See, the event that I want to have happen here, when the flag is clicked, I want to make sure all of the variables are set to zero so that I can put the correct files into their correct places, including showing this instructions um, sprite when the program very first begins. But as soon as I click on the next button, I want it to choose a random number and start doing something else. So this will not be the green flag that I'll put here for the second handler. It's going to be when this sprite is clicked. And what I want it to do, let's go down to variables, is I'm going to set this variable, which is going to be QNum. But instead of setting it to zero, I need to set it to a random number. So to do that, we're going to come up here and find our random number generator. Here it is. Pick random from 1 to 10. I'll just drop it into that little circle. There. And that's exactly the numbers that I want. It will automatically show whatever the value of QNum is as long as I have it on the stage here. So let's go ahead and click the green flag. Okay. So QNum is 0. But now as I roll over this, it's very slow. I'll click on it and QNum just set to 4. Is that following what I want it to do? Well, 4 is between 1 and 10, and it's picking a random number. Let's try that again. Now it's chosen 5. Click on it again. Now 9. It seems to be working. We have not gone beyond 10. I need to actually change the question and the image to match the randomly picked question number. So let me show you how to do that. That's going to take a little bit more. So if I go to the question box, here's the programming that actually looks at QNum. So at the very beginning when the flag is clicked, I switch the costume to QNumber00, which is the basic instructions version of it, and then show it. And then inside this forever loop, it's going to look for what happens when the QNum variable has various things. So if it's equal to zero, I set it to the costume QNum, you know, Q00. If the QNum is one, I set it to the costume 01, you know, the first rock, and so on. And it goes all the way through to 10. And since that's the only possibilities for what QNum can have, since the random number is from 1 to 10, it's just going to set that in the forever loop and look for it until it hits the right number and then sets it to the right picture. Okay. Now, at the same time, the image box does the same thing. It picks different rocks. So its, it's beginning image I call image box blank, and that just doesn't show any rock at all. But then I show that particular sprite, and then inside the variable loop, it's also checking for QNum, and then setting the costume of the image box to whichever value it needs to be. So if it's 0, it's the blank image. If it's 1, it's rock number one, if it's two is rock number two, and so on, all the way down to rock number ten. And those are the only possibilities. Now, as we look then finally at how it keeps score and how it knows what the right questions are, we have to look at the A, B, C, D buttons. And remember in here, I have two different handlers going on at the same time. Now, the second handler here on the right is what happens. And all I've done is created this program once out of a whole bunch of if-then statements, and then I've just copied and pasted it onto each button, and then set the answer number to whatever the button number is. So A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, and D is 4. 
So in this case, it's the A button, and so the answer number variable is set to 1. Since this is being done with a random number generator, we don't know what questions are going to come up when. And so we have to put a program in there that checks for all of them and looks to see if that's the, the, the button that's been clicked on. And if so, and if it's the right one, then the score goes up by 1. So for question 2, the right answer is A, and the score goes up by 1. That's got an answer number of 1. If it's question number 3, the right answer is 2, or B, and so on. After going through all of this, this is not inside of an infinite loop. The rollover effects are, but this is not. This is just a sequential if-then statement list. So at the very end, it'll eventually get down to the bottom and change another variable called counts by 1. In other words, I've clicked on a button once, and so I want to put how many counts on it. But eventually, since there are 10 questions, and I've gone through all 10 questions, as it goes through this, it's going to find which one is correct. And if it is, it will add it up by 1. So it'll look at counts, and then at the end, I'll have counts to compare with the score, and that will give me a final percentage. So let's kind of look at the whole program here. I'm starting it. Let's zoom in on it. So as you saw, all of the variables have been reset to zero at the start of the program. It's also put in question zero, zero, which is the instructions. Now, if I want to get a new question, I click on the next button. And so that activates picking a random number. And then it looks and says, oh, well, which, ra which random number is it? It actually happened to pick one in this case. How do I know? Well, it says question one, but it also says Q number is one up here. So the random number between one and 10, it actually picked one. Okay, so uh, what's the right answer? Which of the following types of rocks is shown here? Well, this is actually basalt. So the correct answer is C. If I were to click on D, well, counts goes up by one. The answer number sh uh, that I gave is 4, but the score remained the same. That tells me that I got it wrong. If I click on C, notice the rollover effect is working, then, ah, the score went up by 1. The answer number was 3 because that was C, but I've tried two times. So right now my percentage is 50%. Now at the same time, I can go on to another question. Click on Next. Again, there it goes. It picked one twice in a row. That can happen. All right, so here it picked question number nine and showed the correct picture and the correct question. And what's the right answer for this? This was an intrusive igneous rock, but it has been heated and compressed so that its crystals are elongated. It is called, well, is it granite? Well, it used to be granite, but not anymore. So when granite turns into something that's metamorphic, it could be nice. I mean, G-N-E-I-S-S. Nice. So B is the correct answer. So I click on that. Ah, score went up by one. It's still Q number nine. The answer number I picked was two. I've tried three times, so it's continuing to work here. Pick a new question. Now it's done number six, and so on. Hopefully this all makes sense to you. The game is basically working now. If I wanted to, I could, I could create an end of game structure to check when they've gone through 10 questions, and then blank out the sprites, calculate a final score, and display it. But you've already seen enough of how to do that. I think you can figure it out on your own. There are many types of games that you can create in Scratch. For example, you could create a maze game where you have a sprite move around through a maze using keyboard arrow commands, and then if it touches the walls of the maze, which will all be a similar color, it can use the if touching color command to bounce off the wall. So that way you can't go through the walls, you have to stay inside the maze. As for the types of media design projects you can create for a STEM class, really the possibilities are endless. I know I say that a lot, but really it's just up to your own imagination. Now that you know how to use Scratch for interactivity and making quizzes and games, you can do anything you want to, as long as you can think it through and plan it. Let me show you some examples from previous student projects. For example, here's a still image of a game that a student created for a kind of a series of games about the periodic table and the elements. Each student had to pick an element. In this case, the student chose bismuth. She created a game called Bismuth Belly Busters. The user has to take these atom balls and then assemble them into a molecule of bismuth subsalicylate. 
That's the active ingredient inside Pepto-Bismol. Here's another example of a student that was studying strontium and did a word search program here. In this case, for each question that comes up, there's a particular answer, this one word, and the student has to find that in the puzzle and click on it. When that happens, when that word is clicked on, it switches the sprite to one that looks like it's highlighted. Ultimately, there are higher-end programs that you can use for game programming, like JavaScript or C++ or some of the other programs that are out there. They take a little bit more learning, but Scratch is a good starting point. Now, if you want to kind of graduate from doing Scratch programs for a desktop computer and want to start programming apps for a cell phone, MIT has also created what's called App Lab, which uses some of the same structures and brick-based programming that you've learned here in Scratch, but it just takes it a step further and allows you to start bringing in uh, JavaScripting and other types of programming languages. It's a good transition. There's also App Inventor and many other programs for making the transition from Scratch to higher-end programming. Now, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching. Please practice Scratch, and as always, keep on learning.